So I'm very pleased to uh, introduce to you Professor Eric Schlissel. He is an assistant professor at the University of Montana and current Mellon Fellow at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, he's the author of several articles and a new textbook in the Chagatai language published uh, here at Maze Books with funding from LRCCS. Uh, and is also working on a forthcoming monograph titled Land of Strangers, the Civilizing Project in Qing, Central Asia. And on top of knowing all these fantastic languages, Eric also knows Swedish uh, from <laughs> a year at, at Harvard and, and because he wanted to access the archives uh, uh, that we have stored in Sweden on Xinjiang, which is a further testament to his dedication to this field and, of course, um, is, is very nice for me. Uh, today he will speak uh, on a colonial Muslim history of Qing Central Asia, revisiting Sairami Tarikhil Hamidi. Uh, please join me in welcoming him. Thanks. Well, thank well, again, thank you, Per, for the very kind introduction. Uh, I've forgotten so much of my Swedish. I feel really badly about that. And thank you, all of you, for coming out in the middle of a polar vortex and the scheduling issues and everything. And thanks especially to the Liberthal Rogo Center for having me. I, I really appreciate the support of the center and it's wonderful to be in Ann Arbor. Uh, I think, speaking of the polar vortex, it's actually a pretty appropriate setting for us to start telling this story about Mullah Musa Sairami. So this is his name, Sairami. Because if you listen to Sairami's biographer, and he was, by the way, from a town called Sairam, hence the name. Supposedly, Sairami spent the last few years of his life in contemplation and recitation of the Quran and constant, doing constant ablutions in a freezing shack as an ascetic, such that one day his apprentice came and found him with icicles hanging from his beard and warmed him by the brazier. But Mullah Musa said, no, take the brazier away. All I need is my Quran recitation. Supposedly, according to the same biographer, Mullah Musa was martyred by the non-believers in Yarkhand in 1917, but according to Sairami's own correspondence, he probably died of illness surrounded by friends and family. So that's the kind of text we're dealing with here. We're dealing with a text that claims to be a history, but is so many things. It's considered the source par excellence for the history of Xinjiang or East Turkestan in the 19th century, a great source for its events. But if we look slightly below the surface and at the front and the back of the text, place where haven't, people have not looked before, we find a lot more going on just below the surface. We find contradictions and mysteries that ultimately, I think, lead us to a greater understanding of the social and cultural history of this multi-ethnic, polycretal borderland. Now, because of the setting, I'm not going to spend a ton of time introducing the region itself, right? This is Xinjiang, a map thereof. I made it from GIS software, circa 1900. Um, we're referring to a region that we might call Chinese Central Asia, right? It's a place where for about the past millennium, most of the people have been Turkic speaking, Sunni Muslims with a strong Sufi influence and some Shiite influence as well, uh, who speak languages similar to Uzbek. And 10 million of these we would now call Uyghurs. It's probably on your mind if you read the news today. So you know the term Uyghurs. The term Uyghur is a little anachronistic when you talk about the pre-1930s period, but I'm going to use it today to refer to Sairami, even though he wasn't even quite what we call a Uyghur today, just so we can talk about the Turkic-speaking Sunni Muslim settled population of most of Xinjiang in a convenient way. So this place has its own kind of distinct history, but we're going to focus on the Qing period, which is really what Sairami is concerned with in his text, right? As students of Chinese history are well aware, from about 1759 to the mid-19th century, uh, the Qing, there's my pointer, uh, ruled Xinjiang indirectly as a separate territory, largely through local institutions, um, through, say, Islamic law, local temporal Turkic speaking Muslim power holders for the most part and a military administration. Until 1864 when, through events we'll explore in a little bit, the Muslim uprisings broke out and there followed a short series of short-lived Islamic states, including most particularly and famously the emirate of the Hokandi adventure Yaqub Beg. In 1877, we have a reconquest by the Hunan-based Xiang army and this Xiang army, and this is really what my book focuses on, reestablished control, but also set about transforming this indirectly ruled territory 
into a regular Chinese province like Hunan or Hubei or Henan or any place like this. Uh, for three decades, the Xiang army and its members dominated the provincial government and uh, attempted to carry out a civilizing project aimed at transforming the Muslim family to conform to their own sort of elite Confucian norms. Um, so today I'm going to talk about one of the richest sources written during this period and dealing with the experience of that period. Originally, I wasn't going to read the Tarahi Hamdi too closely when I started this project. I wanted to know about voices from below. I was looking at archives, legal texts, documents, things like this, the thing about politics of translation. And it felt like the Tarahi Hamdi, this book, had been read before. Everyone sort of made reference to it because it tells you the series of events very carefully. But one day, I think it was in 2011, there was a lecture on Qing Xinjiang, and someone, I think it was Elizabeth Perry, asked the question, what did Uyghurs think about being ruled by Chinese? And it struck me that no one had really addressed this question, which seems timely and important and relevant. There's one paper on it, maybe, that really talked about Uyghur views of the Qing as expressed in Chagatai language sources. So Chagatai sources, uh, this is like pre-modern Uyghur language. It's written in Arabic script. It's a Turkic language and uh, well, that's what my textbook will teach you. Thanks again to the Lieberthal Rogel Center for funding the publication of this through Maze Books. You can also download a legal PDF of this for free from the Maze Books website if you ever want to learn Chagatai. Um, so I cannot express how grateful I am for the support. Thank you, seriously. So Mullah Musa Sairami lived out his life across this whole period, right? from the period of indirect rule through the Islamic states, their rise and their very swift fall, and then this period of reconstruction and provincialization. Um, and he'd known, I mean, he'd experienced indirect rule quite intimately. He'd taught uh, in a madrasa during that period. He worked as a tax collector under these uh, independent states. And then with the reconquest, it's not really clear what he did. I suspect that he actually worked for the Qing state for quite some time. Um, and then supposedly finished his life as an ascetic. And while the middle part of his work details this period very well, the front and the back of it do very different things. The front and the back of the book deal with the primordial history of humanity, the history of China, and the nature of power. So Mullah Musa evaluates the cosmic and mundane reasons for the great puzzle of history in Xinjiang as it seemed for Uyghurs in the 19th century. How was it that a non-Muslim power had gained power over Xinjiang in the first place? Why did it fall? And then why did it come back again? How could holy war fail? How could non-believers hold rule over Muslims? The violence of this period here had left the people of Xinjiang with a kind of whiplash, a kind of traumatic experience, a sense of permanent loss of an old order, a permanent loss of the protection of the old Qing emperor. Something had qualitatively changed in the way that they were being ruled and their relationship with China. And there is a need in the literature to work out what that new relationship was. And Mullah Musa probably did the most monumental effort in trying to make that intelligible in Muslim terms. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. What an, a Muslim intellectual living inside this system saw of the Qing Empire and of Chinese power. And the general experience of humanity, of heteronomy, of one group of people ruling another. So first though, some context. Oh, I'm sorry. This is part of his text where he announces his purpose. He says that it's been 40 years and no one has written this history because they don't want to face what happened in that period. And so he wants to recollect the events before they pass out of popular memory. So more context. Now I indicated that there was a civilizing project to transform the Muslim family. Um, to make a very long story short, the central concern of the Xiang army when they got to Xinjiang was this idea that Muslims did not have proper family relations that they were very nearly proper Confucians. They were very nearly normative imperial subjects because they read books, but not the right books. They had scholars, but they weren't the right scholars. 
So they were nearly Confucian. And if only we could change the family, we would get them there. Uh, so we're going to see in Mullah Musa's work uh, a concern with genealogy that I believe reflects this broader heightened awareness of issues around descent, patriline, death, loss, childhood, and the integrity of the family. A big part of this project was also a system of Confucian schools in which Uyghur or Turkic Muslim boys were educated in the classics and in Chinese language. The idea being that they would then go back to their families and seed society with Confucian norms, transforming the family from within, making a province from the ground up. Now, that's the context in which Mullah Musa undertook his labor, but we have to understand that it's not just one book. It's a polyvocal kind of text that comes in multiple versions and owes a lot to its sources. Uh, Mullah Musa's first attempt was called the Tarik Emniya, and the title refers to apparently the sense of peace and order that he felt under Qing rule, having had it restored uh, after the Muslim uprisings. Well, he wrote several versions of this himself and kept updating it until later he got to the Tarih Hamidi, which was named for the Ottoman Sultan and Caliph Abdul Hamid II. So you can tell that his opinions of the Qing state seem to have changed rather rapidly over the course of a few years. So we have five known manuscripts uh, that also includes one that has a sequel or continuation of the text by Hulam Muhammad Khan of Yarkand that builds on Sairami's text. And I think of these in some ways as being one whole because Ghulam Muhammad so effectively uses Sairami's ideas and frames to continue the story into the 1920s. Um, I suspect, based on my textual work so far, that there are at least two other manuscripts out there. And there's a rumor of one that was written in the 1950s that's very divergent too. Who knows? So I think there's, there's a lot of this out here in part because it traveled pretty far. Copies of the Tarik uh, Yemedi are known, well, there's a print version made in Kazan and Tatarstan. Uh, there's one copy, which is an autograph in his own hand, holograph, held in Beijing, but it was copied in Kumul or Hami down in Yarkand. It was sent to Tarbagatai. People read this work and they engaged with it too. So I think it's significant beyond simply what Sairami reflected on. Other people absorbed it as well. To distinguish Sairami from others, there were other people chronicling the same period in very different ways. So Haji Yusuf, for example, intended to depict Yaqub Beg as a lost cause, effectively, a, a brave holy warrior who only lost power because of the betrayal of others, and a successor to the line of world conquerors like Alexander, Chinggis, or Timur, uh, Tamerlane. Someone like Qurban Ali Khalidi up in the north took a much more rational, sort of self-consciously cosmopolitan approach to this period and was sort of a very skeptical author who in many ways wanted to transcend the paradigm that he was working in. Mullah Musa is interesting to me because he remains in the framework of traditional Perso-Islamic history writing and tries to apply it to his world as a skeptical analytical scholar. And naturally, that meant drawing a variety of standard and not so standard sources. So even though Mullah Musa could read Arabic and Persian, he was educated, he calls himself a Turki Mullah and says, I can only really read Turkic. I can only really read Chagatai. So a lot of his sources he actually knows from translations into Turkic of uh, Persian language sources that had come earlier. And it also seems that he's communicative in Chinese, which I find really interesting. Um, he frequently uses Chinese terminology, which is one of the things that makes the text really hard to read, by the way, because it's hard to tell what a Chinese word is when it's an Arabic script with no tones or anything. Thank you, Mullah Musa. Um, and some of his folk etymologies are a little specious, but it seems like he was pretty well engaged with Chinese discourse. He uses phrases that he seems to have gotten from mostly Hui, uh, Chinese-speaking Muslim interlocutors. And he also draws on some Chinese sources either directly or indirectly from this, which we'll return to later. And weirdly, this also shows up in the text. So he really is trying to engage textually with Chinese language and Chinese sources as well. And this, I think, is a big part of what makes the Tariq Hamdi so valuable. It's not just one person's analysis or perspective on this period. 
Sairami uh, gives us a repository of often contradictory narratives, voices and perspectives that are kind of loosely held together or mediated by this one scholarly voice. He's very present in the text. He'll say things like, and I've forgotten what day it was when this happened, I have notes somewhere. He's very present in the text, and he'll give you five versions of the same story and tell you which one he thinks is correct. So, if we read with him and against him, we can therefore learn a great deal beyond Sairami himself. Now, as I stated in the talk, the title of the talk, this is, to my mind, a kind of colonial history. Let me clarify what I mean by that. I don't just mean as a history of a period of domination, but what I mean is that Sairami is drawing on a tradition of history writing that's mostly written sort of under the patronage or commission of a ruler to legitimize them and glorify them. But Sairami isn't being asked by any power holder to do this. He doesn't have a patron. The Qing court is certainly not asking him to write a history of the Qing. And yet he uses those same tools to sort of work out this experience of domination, to make Chinese power intelligible in his own terms, in the terms his audience will understand. Um, Yeah, and to work out his own position, which again, I think was much less stable than it might be presented by his biographer. So let's start where Sairami does in that case, uh, with the outbreak of the Muslim uprisings on the night of June 3rd, 1864, in the city of Kucha and the burning of the Chinese settlements, the Waishang Bazaars outside of the city. You would think that this being a chronicle, Sairami would go to the next event. He'd go to June 4th, June 5th. No, he jumps straight into the deepest depths of the primordial history of humanity to explain why the Muslim uprisings broke out. So, let's see, where exactly are we? Right, so he's going to demonstrate the ancient relationship between the Chinese sovereign and its Muslim subjects because in, in the, it's in this breach of the peace that we can explain the origins of the peace and the reasons for it. And he traces those to, here we go, the Tang Dynasty, the ninth century or thereabouts, or maybe the seventh century, and the legend of the Prophet Muhammad's embassy to the court in Chang'an. Now, to make a very long story short, because there are many versions of this story, the emperor has a dream, usually he's threatened by a dragon, and then a man wearing a turban and a green coat, therefore the Prophet Muhammad, this is how he looks, saves him from the dragon. He wakes up, his dream interpreters tell him, oh, there's this guy called Muhammad who's claiming to be a prophet off to the west. And the emperor says, bring me this Muhammad. I want to learn about him. Uh, the story comes from an older Hui tradition, the Hui Hui Yuan Lai, the origins of the Hui. And for them, it's sort of an origin story for the Sino-Muslim community. But for Sairami, it serves not just that purpose, but also another. In Sairami's telling, the prophet himself does not come to Beijing. The mission is frustrated. The letter doesn't arrive at his destination. But his ambassadors do come to the court at Chang'an. They pass through Xinjiang, leaving tombs that become sites of pilgrimage and worship. And once they get to the court in China, the Beijing Iklimi, the land of Beijing, there's a debate the emperor's ministers, some of them advise him to accept this new religion, the other half tell him not to. And secretly, Tang Wang Khan, the great king of, king of Tang, accepts the faith. Now, even though gradually his descendants forgot their Islam, nevertheless, they maintained the covenants that this emperor made with his Muslim people, that they should always protect the Sharia and the integrity of the Muslim community. So what does this do for us? Uh, so I'll tell you that this is actually the last in a series of stories of conversion in the first part of Sairami's book that most people ignored because they seem like they're just copied from other texts. But all of those are dual conversions. And I'll spare you a lot of the background, but this is a trope in Central Asian conversion literature, is that there's a partway conversion where someone has to hide their Islam for a while and then reveal it later where a father will come and start the conversion, then a son will complete it. And for this, we have this incomplete conversion that seems to hold open the possibility that the emperor will someday realize 
his ancestral Islam, because after all, the Qing emperors, according to Sai Rami, are descendants of the Tang emperors. So much for dynasties. Indeed, there's another version of the story that circulated at the same time in which the emperor did convert and led a great holy war across China, smashing the idols in the Buddhist and Taoist temples and establishing an Islamic state. We know that didn't happen. Sai Rami knows it didn't happen. But the conceit helps him make an, M, an argument about the Qing dynasty as it had been. The early Qing dynasty had protected Islam. It had been an indirect system of rule that it maintained the integrity of the Muslim community. The old Qing emperors, he suggests, were like the good Turco-Mongol rulers of Eurasia who, despite being non-believers, protected and respected the Sharia as God's will on earth. And so Mullah Musa raises the specter of Anushirvan, the great pre-Islamic king, who was also a source of justice and protection. But more than that, we find that the justice of the Qing sovereign is tied to family and genealogy that runs even deeper. So Mullah Musa, I said, is skeptical of the old stories. He picks and chooses what seems to be true. Muslim, the emperor's secret Muslim, great. But the legend of Alan Koa, the woman who laid with a being of light that came through the smoke hole in her yurt and gave rise to the line of Chinggis Khan, he thinks is nonsense, and he spends a few pages explaining why. He suggests that the Chinggisids, the sons of Chinggis Khan, have used this story to legitimate their own uh, impure origins as uh, basically as, as bastards, as illegitimate children, and to cover up their own great misdeeds. Um, however, the same skeptical historian also mines another set of geneal genealogical tales that go even deeper into history to strengthen his arguments. So there's a genre of literature called the stories of the prophets, and if you're a China scholar, you don't have to worry about this too much, but basically these are stories that surround the Quran and expand on these narratives. And a lot of them are about the origins of people. So if you look at the stories of Noah, Nuh, and his three sons, Ham, Sam, and Japheth, biblical Japheth, we get stories about where peoples come from. Now, in much of this literature, the origins of the Turks aren't even explained, much less the origins of the Chinese. But Mullah Musa does engage with this. He actually builds on a tradition that was appearing in Kashgar in the middle of the 18th century that does try to explain where the Chinese come from and where they fit into this scheme. He tells us about how the children of Japheth settled in their various lands and fell into alliances and conflicts. So far, so normal. But he adds certain things to these stories. He expands the list of Japhetic peoples to include not just the Chinese, but the Manchus and the Qing, the Da Qing, that's interesting, which are labeled separately as descendants in turn of Turk, who is the older brother of Qin. So this means that the ancient descendant of all the Chinese emperors and all the Chinese people is a brother of Turk, and Turk himself is the ancestor of Manchus, Mongols, Tatars, and the Da Qing, however we're going to interpret that. By the way, he paints the Chinese people in a very favorable light as good craftsmen and clever individuals. Now, the point is to establish that the peoples of Eastern Eurasia were originally brothers who possessed a special close relationship licensed by God, but one that was frustrated as people began to grow apart and speak different languages. Mullah Musa innovates in these stories by saying that these primordial brothers and cousins actually had to speak through interpreters over time. Um, much as the Uyghurs of Xinjiang need to speak through interpreters to communicate with the Chinese. Now, this is not to say that under the old Qing regime there were no translators. Obviously, there had been. That's how you talk to people who speak radically different languages as Uyghur and Chinese are. But under the Xiang army program with these Confucian schools, there is this insistence on the use of Chinese language. And the language became more prevalent and more prominent and more necessary. And therefore, so did the presence of interpreters and translators. This became a clear, present, and pervasive issue. So disunity in the ancient past therefore reflected the disruption of relationships in the present through the fields of translation, but also family life. Remember, the other half of the civilizing project is changing the Muslim family. 
and trying to change how family members relate to each other. Now, as for Qin specifically, this one brother, ah, yes, okay. This is just a couple of pages that are very rich in the text. By the way, his handwriting is awful, and this is a printout of a scan of a microfilm of a manuscript. This one means no one reads this book. Uh, so as for Qin, Mullah Musa asserts furthermore that not only are all descendants, are all the emperors of China descendants of the secretly Muslim king of the Tang, but also are part of an unbroken line going way back to the time of the peopling of the earth. Qin is the ancestor of all the emperors of China. So much for dynasties once again. But this is the one dynasty, sorry, genealogy that Sairami doesn't seem to doubt, apart from his own, of course. And on this basis, he makes a pretty wild assertion that China cannot be conquered. So it means that this line of kingship is older than that of Alexander the Great, which is supposed to be the oldest. That means that Alexander the Great, okay, so in a lot of the Alexander narratives in the Islamic world, Iskander, Alexander conquers China. In the version you get in Xinjiang, they trick him into thinking he conquered China. And Mullah Musa accepts that. He is supposedly bedazzled by Chinese women, Alexander, uh, and then believes himself to have been you know, accepted as a true father of the Chinese people, but they buy him off and send him on his way. Same with Chinggis Khan, his descendants. Supposedly there was no real Mongol conquest of China because God protected China. Amir Timur, Tamerlane, marched eastward towards China and then died in the cold. So for Mullah Musa, this suggests that there is a special relationship between the just emperors of China and God, which gives this state its protection. But that also means that when Chinese power wavers, something disastrous must be happening. If this great unwobbling pivot in the world suddenly twists, the fabric of the cosmos might be coming apart. And so we're back at the question of why the Muslim uprisings could have happened and why the Qing conquest succeeded, because that's a big wobble in this history. Basically, Mullah Musa indicates that the loss of justice in the Xinjiang administration not on the part of the emperor, but on the part of local officials, was part of a cosmic hiccup. So you see, in the Central Asian tradition, as it had evolved at this point, the fortunes of a ruler were greatly tied to astro astrology and the influence of stars. So Amir Timur was born under the fortunate conjunction. The Qing emperors, for the most part, were also born under great conjunctions, until we get to the Tongzhi emperor, who he says, Sairami says, was born unfortunately under a bad star. Tongzhi and his court, Mullah Musa tried to, uh, Mullah Musa explains to us, couldn't understand why under his reign, the Qing fell to pieces. It was assailed by wars, internal and external, the Taiping, the Nian, the British are nipping at the gates. The Muslim uprisings happen. And all of a sudden there are these English people who are in places like Burma and the French are in Southeast Asia. They're wondering what is happening here? Why is a world falling apart? And meanwhile, on the other end of the empire, Xinjiang's cut off from the Qing, they're cut off from the emperor. And this adventurer named Yaku Beg comes from Central Asia and establishes a state. Now, in Mullah Musa's narrative, Yaku Beg's star begins to rise above the horizon as Tongzhi's dips below it. The problem was with Yaku Beg, he might have been a holy warrior, but he was prone, Mullah Musa says, to bouts of rage, fits of anger that inflicted pain upon Muslims. He massacres the Hui, the Chinese-speaking Muslims. And Mullah Musa hints that maybe Yaku Beg is not the just ruler that the Muslims needed after all. Back in Beijing, the royal astrologers informed the Tongzhi emperor of their findings. Because he was born under an unlucky star, he would never have justice in his rule, not until he was buried under the earth and allowed his more fortunate cousin Guangxu to take the throne. So in a brilliant move in 1875, the Tongzhi emperor faked his death and descended into the Qing royal tombs outside of Beijing, a topic with which Sairami seems particularly concerned and curious. I'm still exploring that. Tricked the earth into accepting that Guangxu had now succeeded to the throne. The Chinese conducted bizarre Chinese magical rituals that immediately turned Guangxu from a baby to a man and made him uh, a valid ruler over the empire. By the way, this, this discussion of Chinese magic reflects, I think, the old image of the emperor of China that we have in Persian literature, the Hakan Echin, e 
but it's also a reflection of this insistence that the Xiang army also had on establishing temples and doing public rituals. So all of a sudden, Chinese worship became very visible in Xinjiang in Sai Rami's period. Ah, yes, here we go. And then the people's patience was exhausted from all the taxation and wars. So they turned their faces to the court of the creator, their eyes brimming with tears and wished for the emperor of China, their cries and pleas growing ever louder. Wow, right? <laughs> Finally, one day, in the midst of what they call the time of Islam, and there are jokes in Sai Rami's text about how people are getting tired of Islam, Sai Ram, uh, Yaakubeg flies into a rage and beats one of his old friends to death. Retiring to the courtroom, uh, to the throne room, he says he feels unwell, asks for a tiny cup of cold tea. And as soon as he raises it to his lips, he turns pale, he cries out and he falls onto the floor in a coma. Two days later, Yaakub Beg was dead. The Xiang army therefore rolled across East Turkestan. They'd just begun their march and were pushing Yaakub Beg's forces into the south. But this was a moment when all of a sudden the tide turned. Yaakub Beg's military fell apart and all of a sudden Chinese rule seemed to be reestablished in a matter of months. Between 1876 and 1878, the Xiang army rolled across Xinjiang with very little resistance. So according to Sai Rami, there's a very simple principle at work here. God grants the crown to those who are just and who treat their Muslim people well. And sometimes that ruler is a Chinese emperor who doesn't know that he is a Muslim and who's born under a fortunate star and has agreed since time immemorial to protect his Muslim people. How are we here again? <laughs> Ah, yes. So around the time that Sai Rami passed away, I mentioned that there is a continuator for his text. Ghulam Muhammad writes a sequel that takes the logic of Sai Rami's work and extends it into the 1920s. So naturally, he has to explain the Xinhai Revolution and the fall of the Qing, which to him is a global epical event, because he accepts the idea that the emperors are descendants of Qin and have been around since the primordial era. So in 1911, he explains, the Xuantong Emperor had no children. Now, in reality, Xuantong was five years old, but that's neither here nor there. Instead, Ghulam Muhammad relates how a corrupt minister poisoned the emperor and his loving mother, and instead placed his own son on the throne as an illegitimate non-kin heir, thus bringing an end, after thousands of years, to the royal rule of Qin. Now it looks like Ulam Moham is playing on rumors you would have heard that circulated in Xinjiang at this time about Empress Dowager Cixi poisoning the emperor and things like this. This is all in the mix here somewhere. But to cut to the chase, he states that for reasons that remain unclear, this scoundrel, this corrupt minister, decides that he's going to use this imperial power to establish Confucian schools across Xinjiang and force Turkic Muslim Uyghur boys to speak Chinese such that once again, they must speak to their fathers through a translator. It looks like uh, the Xiang army civilizing project is making a direct impact on Ghulam Muhammad's evaluation of history. The old order wavered in 1864. It kind of came back in 1877. There's a brief optimism, but then the Qing Empire has fallen. Why would that be? Well, God will not stand for this, right? He shatters the Qing Empire, which falls into civil war, and its diverse peoples are separated once again. And across Asia, then peoples who were once ruled by legitimate royal lines fall to Christianity, as he puts it, and to innovation, bid'ah. The Russian Empire falls to the Bolsheviks, the Hejaz to the Saudis, whom Ghulam Muhammad does not care for in the least, and there are rumblings of Jadidism, Islamic reformism, the Ottoman lands in Afghanistan and Kashmir, and it seems to Ghulam Muhammad that the death of the last member of the line of Qin has signaled the end of a global order that arguably seemed to preserve the integrity of Islamic communities. Speaking of which, I want to make this note. I think I misplaced it in my notes, but why is Da Qing here? Okay, we've been talking about the unity and disunity of peoples so far. And this, I think, is part of Sai Rami's argument about why the Qing seems to be a good thing. He recalls the legend of how 
two descendants of Turk, Mongol and Tatar, despite being brothers, have an ancient enmity. The Mongols and the Tatars will always fight. And of course, this also has to do with Chinggis Khan's personal history. So there's a sense of an ancient enmity between otherwise brotherly peoples. According to him, the Da Qing, the Great Qing, is a result of a union between the Mongol and Tatar peoples that resolves that conflict. Now, he might be referring in some ways to the creation of the new Manchu people out of the Jurchen and to the alliance of the early Manchus with the Mongols. There might be an echo of that in there somewhere, but for Sairami rhetorically, the point is that the Qing is a force that resolves old conflicts and brings peoples back together, at least in its ideal and ancient form. So that's why I think the Da Qing here is listed as one of the sons of Turk. All right, so here's where we've been so far. We have Mullah Musa using some of the tools of Perso-Islamic history writing to explain Chinese or Qing power, and arguably to legitimize it without the Qing even asking him to. He's done that by curating a set of stories gathered from a variety of sources, some of which remain obscure and hopefully will emerge during the further textual work. And these stories emphasize two central mechanisms in the rise and fall of rulers, justice and genealogy. They indicate an ancient affinity between the Turks and the Chinese as peoples and as rulers. And although Sairami might not be quite clear on the relationship between the Qing and China, he's clearly communicating that the Turkic Muslim people of Xinjiang have been tied to the center of Chinese power since time immemorial, either as brothers or as protected subjects. So to me, in this sense, both Mullah Musa Sairami and his continuator Ghulam Muhammad are making Xinjiang central to the history of China. It's the path through which Islam arrived in China, thus binding the history of Revelation and the history of Arabia to this ancient and separate history of China and resolving a primordial estrangement between peoples. The corruption of the emperor's officials in the borderland was intimately tied to developments in the center in the person of the emperor and not led not only to the Muslim uprisings, but to the multiple wars that then plagued the Qing in the mid 19th century. Later, the Xiang army's project to turn Muslims into Confucians, disrupted families and violated the integrity of the Muslim community, angering God, leading to the downfall of the Qing and the Xinhai revolution. So this kind of intimate connection in my analysis reflects a broader process of transculturation so in, in Ortiz and Pratt's kind of definition, transculturation points to this selective appropriation of the forms and vocabularies of a dominant culture for creating new kinds of meanings outside of it, a kind of invention that tends to appear in frontiers and borderlands, but for the most part remains obscure to us. We can't see this process happening because it mostly occurs beyond the written text at the popular level. But Mary Pratt points to this work by Guaman Poma de Ayala, if you've, ever, if you've ever heard of this, basically an, uh, a Peruvian native Spanish prince who writes a history of Spain and Christendom that puts Peru at the center. And who creates this mystical connection between the ancient history of the Andes and the history of Christianity all the way back down to this sacred history of origins and revelations. So in some ways, I think of Sairami as doing something similar in the first and last parts of his chronicle surrounding the events of the 19th century. So on the one hand, these authors are making China intelligible in the Islamic paradigm of history writing, but they're also using that same approach to place their own homeland into a more intimate and direct relationship with the center. On the topic of making things intelligible, so for the last big point I want to get to here, and there's a lot more we could talk about, I want to show one more way in which Mullah Musa and the people in his time made late Qing Chinese rule comprehensible. And that is through their interpretation of imperial and Chinese law. Now, law, I'm going to put some scare quotes around that because really we're talking about law-like systems and we can get to that in the Q&A. But, sorry, uh, technically in the Qing, of course, there was no distinction between imperial law and Chinese law, right? There's the Qing Code. It builds on centuries of legal tradition dating back to the Tang and arguably earlier than that, and has the same textual core. On the other hand, Mullah Musa and others around him in Xinjiang made a distinction between Qing law, 
and Chinese law. I have to wonder, is that a useful distinction? Is that a, an interesting observation? I think it is. So before the Muslim uprisings, as I said, Islamic law and legal institutions had prevailed in East Turkestan. You know, capital cases, major outbreaks of violence were often sent to the Qing authorities for executions and such. But for the most part, issues did not leave the local level. Conflicts were remanded to local dispute mediation processes and to Islamic courts and judges. After 1877, the Xiang army wanted to exclude Islamic authorities from those processes and instead bring justice into the Yaman, into the local center of Chinese power. They didn't really succeed. Uh, according to a lot of my research, actually Islamic courts reorganized and strengthened in a lot of places. But nevertheless, um, many Uyghurs now went to the Yaman with their troubles, including some pretty minor and petty disputes. There's a lot of forum shopping for dispute mediation. Um, here, I think that Lauren Benton's approach to legal pluralism, sort of typologically speaking, is really useful because we can think of the earlier Qing as kind of an expansionist, confident, and plural, strong empire that was willing to and able to maintain pluralism in its various borderlands, right? And was capable of utilizing those different vocabularies of power to express itself. So Qing power kind of had an Islamic face, at least at the local level. But the late Qing government of Xinjiang under the Xiang army was instead homogenizing or assimilatory. So it reflected the attempt of a weakening empire to use uh, ravaged by conflict and facing a crisis of legitimacy and a shortage of resources. These sorts of powers try to mobilize people instead by imposing their own will and norms on the internal other and sort of mobilizing more of their human labor force, drawing more people into the center under the guise of a civilizing project. So because you can't perform sovereignty or collect more resources by conquering more territory, you instead act on an internal population that's both included in the empire and excluded from it. There's not fully participatory in it to mobilize their bodies through a kind of discipline. Now we're getting into Foucault, but the point is the essence of law in the eyes of the Xiang army leadership was related to that effort to bring people into the Chinese ecumen. And so, it revolved around what they believed Uyghurs lacked, family, rites, rituals, filial piety, the things that seemed to make a good Confucian a good Confucian. And so they imposed a regime of legal exception. And this is something I've written on elsewhere and we can talk about in the Q&A, where basically uh, violations of these specific parts of the Qing code dealing with family and corpses and issues like this were punished much more stringently. The idea being that we have to maintain the integrity of the family, else the rest of the law is meaningless. And to propagate this idea of ritual and propriety, they cobbled together a book called the Li Kitabi, the Book of Li. Huh. Well, what the heck is Li? Well, it's an awkward translation of a primer printed in Anhui that combines stories from the 24 filial exemplars, the Arshu Xiao and excerpts from the Qing code that illustrated those stories, um, lessons about filial piety. So they translated it very badly, I have to say, into Chagatai and distributed it everywhere, suggesting that, uh, well, so that it could be recited orally by a village headman every two weeks in the, in the imperial tradition of the village lecture. So we're going to take a Confucian idea of li, ritual, rites, propriety, and try to communicate it to a Turkic-speaking population by turning this really culturally Chinese text into an awkward Chagatai translation, and we're not going to translate the word li. This led to a great working out among Turkic Muslims in Xinjiang of what this li thing was supposed to be, because they kept hearing, and here's a report from Ney Elias, that th that isn't li. You can't do that, that's not li. That's out of accord with the li. What the heck is the Li? It was pretty fuzzy, and on the ground, you know, informally, soldiers seemed to think that the Li meant being Chinese or acting in a normatively Chinese way that they were used to. <coughs> a bilingual glossary that was created for the Confucian schools does gloss the word Li for the benefit of the students, but it's only a one-word gloss. It's adeplik, which basically means being polite, 
good comportment, politeness, propriety, it's, just, it's not a useful translation. And so as people worked out what Li was, we find in all the European sources that it seems to be a kind of law, right? Li is translated by Swedish missionaries and British investigators and Russian investigators and this one Syrian guy as a kind of law. Because that's the impression that they get. Well, how do they get the idea that it was a kind of law or, as Elias says, a code? Well, Mullah Musa invokes Li several times in the Tariq Yehemadi and always as a kind of rule or qaidah that defines membership in the imperial community. So he would almost seem to buy into Xiang army propaganda here. So Li, rites, ritual, is something that one must learn to be a good subject, but that one is not forced to learn. Or perhaps it's, it's, it's something by which one is transformed subtly and willingly to become more Chinese, more Confucian, more civilized, more culturally proper. To Sai Rami, the emperor is very forgiving. He wants everyone to follow the Li, but he's not going to make you follow the Li. So you can either be a part of your distinct community or you can join this great land of Li. Elsewhere, he juxtaposes the Li with the Sharia. Hmm, okay. This further hints that there's some sort of implied equivalence between uh, Islamic law, which is not a great, great translation of Sharia, but a system of abstract categories to be imposed on the everyday, uh, a working out from a textual tradition of what God's will on earth is. It seems like the Chinese have this too because it's also really concerned with the way you live your life and the way you structure your family. That to a jurist living around Kashgar, Turpan in the 1890s is what Sharia seems to be. And it's very similar in their eyes to what the Li coming from the Xiang army would seem to be. So I wish that Mullah Musa had left us a smoking gun to say that he understood Confucian social moral doctrines as the Chinese equivalent of Sharia. But to establish that, we'll have to look a bit beyond the text to various other attempts to work out what exactly the Chinese law is or the Qing law is in this context of pluralism. So in Islamic doctrine, very simply put, the revelation has come to everybody at some point. It's just a lot of people have forgotten it or it's become corrupted over time. So it could be with the other peoples of the world, including those of China. There are various attempts, it's not the only place I've seen this, to explain that Chinese law and ways of being is actually a remnant of Mosaic law. Others, and I didn't bring this particular quote, but there are others who distinguish the law of the Li Fan Yuan, the court of colonial affairs, through which Xinjiang was indirectly ruled as a set of textual rules, the Qing code basically. So infractions and punishments, that's what defines earlier Qing law. That's contrasted to the later law of the Chinese, which is this Sharia-like system that Mullah Musa and others are seeing in the late Qing Chinese regime. Indeed, in Sai Rami's time, Muslims seem to have developed this belief in the ultimate divine inspiration of Chinese law and the sort of commensurability of these two systems. Even though there's no clear translation, and I haven't found a systematic attempt to work between these two things, they see something in the Xiang army's imposition of a regime of socio-moral transformation that reminds them of a different Islamic tradition, and it seems to make it comparable. And indeed, Mullah Musa tries to work out that relationship as well. In his discussion of what he calls the history of Khans, the Khan La Tarhi, or the Gang Zheng, which I finally figured out thanks to some help of my friends, is the Gang Jian Yi Zhi Lu, or a simple guide to the Zizhi Tong Jian, the comprehensive mirror and aid of governance. So this is basically a simple introduction to Chinese history and institutions that would have been pretty readily available in Xinjiang around the time Sai Rami was writing. I think he only read like the first five pages because that's what he uses to try and com make commensurable his own ancient history of the peoples of the earth, uh, the history of the, of the Muslim peoples, and the history of China. By figuring out whether or not this Fudak character from Islamic sort of primordial history is the same as this Feng fellow, it's the surname of the Taihao Fuxi. Uh, Fuxi was supposed to invent all sorts of things in ancient Chinese history. Um, but ultimately, that's a skip to the chase. 
he asserts that the Chinese people follow the Sharia of something he calls Lu Wang, Liu Wang, or Liu Wang, who's a figure who aided the Zhou in overthrowing the Shang and establishing the ideal order of the ancient Zhou past. So in some ways, Sairami is being observant, right? He has some idea that Confucian ideals are supposed to reflect the golden age of the Zhou. They seem to be rooted in this uh, socio-moral ground-up approach and building an ideal society based on scripture, and that this is what the Chinese follow. And it's similar to Sharia. I think he's right. I think that observing this distinction between what you might think of as sultanic law and Sharia in, say, the Ottoman context or elsewhere is similar to seeing this contrast between a Qing pseudo-sultanic law and a social-moral system of law-like rules based on scripture in the context of the late Qing. So that's sort of something I'm still thinking through and working with. So to conclude, Sairami presents this, I would say, with a clever reversal. The Xiang army would assert that the Turkic Muslims of Xinjiang were not quite civilized, right? They read books, they have classics, but they're not the right books and classics. They have families, but the families aren't quite right. It needs adjustments. It needs civilization. They're nearly there, but not quite. Hence the need for the civilizing project. Now, Mullah Musa would say the opposite, right? He would turn around and say, the Chinese have a corrupted revelation, an imperfect version of the Sharia based on corrupted scriptures and older revelation. They have an, a version of the Sharia, but it's not in accordance with the Quran. Hence the possibility that the emperor of China may rediscover his own Islam and the original Islam of the Chinese people and fulfill the promise made in secret by his ancestor in the Tang. Hence the ability of the Qing to deliver justice, sometimes with an even greater effect than a Muslim ruler who fails to comport himself in accord with the Sharia. In many ways, Mullah Musa's histories are very much in the tradition of Persian Islamic history writing, as we've known it under various Turco-Mongol rulers across Eurasia. But I think that Sarami's position and that of the people uh, to whom he described himself as belonging, I think that this position of being dominated by a group of actors who are explicitly trying to assimilate Muslims and remove that tradition rather than simply rule Muslims and take on that face and that mantle, changes his perspective and approach in really important ways. It's one thing to praise a ruler who's decided to take on the mantle of Islamic legitimacy. It's quite another to use the tools of history writing at your disposal to write that ruler into history in a way that makes the world intelligible for you. Indeed, I would argue that Mullah Musa's account of the 19th century and of the history of the world reflects a profound sense of nostalgia for a world that was lost, the world of plurality and empire. And to put it another way, a world in which Muslims in general and Uyghurs specifically were allowed to live their own way of life. And although that golden age might have been imagined, it was still a powerful idea in late Qing, Xinjiang. Now, Mullah Musa and I are going to spend a lot more time together over the next year. Uh, I've received an NEH fellowship to complete a whole translation of this work over the next year. Uh, and hopefully it'll be classroom ready before too long, uh, along with the scholarly edition of the various messy manuscripts. Um, but I need to say that I'm doing this in part because the last time I saw a number of my Uyghur and Chinese colleagues uh, in China, they were very supportive of this idea. Uh, there's no great translation of a work like Sairami's from the Uyghur area. Like there are translations of Tibetan sources and Mongol sources, but the great Uyghur history hasn't been translated. In a sense, because Sairami's position, as I think you've noticed, is so awkward and so strange, and he's not really on one side or another, but he's an intellectual working things out. To read his source today adds a certain nuance to the discussions around Xinjiang and around Uyghurs. So my colleagues have really supported this idea, uh, both Chinese and Uyghur. Um, Unfortunately, at this time, nearly all of those Uyghur colleagues are now disappeared uh, in re-education camps or in prisons. And so as I go forward, a big part of my goal is to honor what they've done, to build on their work and our common project, to contribute to human knowledge, uh, and to amplify their voices. Because really, my colleagues in Xinjiang have been dedicated to this kind of historical research that brings these uncomfortable, complicated texts to light for quite some time. Uh, now they can't do that research anymore. So that's part of my purpose here. Anyway, thank you very, very much for listening and for your attention.
Uh, and I look forward to the conversation that I hope will ensue. Thank you. So should I just take questions or? Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the talk. I'll start with Professor Mugler. Hi, um, thanks for that really Hi. fascinating talk. So you're putting this text in the context of the, the you know, Persian Islamic tradition and that's, I don't really need it, okay. Um, and, and that's great, but I, I wanted to invite you to, to try to show us how to think about this book in the context of sort of more local mm. Uyghur, if you will, historical production. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure you're, I know you must be familiar with Ryan Thumb's book about these Tuskira texts that mm -hmm. are, you know, that are kind of um, uh, basically hagiographies of saints who are attached to shrines and the texts become attached to shrines and they're important. Thumb shows us in this, in these traditions of pilgrimage from sh shrine to shrine. Is this a Tuskira text? Would Thumb call it one? Um, is it is it attached to any kind of specific place? Um, how do we think about it in relation to what we know about local historical production in Xinjiang? Now, that's an excellent question. So Ryan would argue, and I think he's basically right, that sort of shrine visitation and the recitation of local histories of revelation and the arrival of Islam helps people cobble together different kinds of identities rooted in history and place, right? Um, actually, Ryan suggests that the Tariqi Hamdi is not significant in his own book. And I, I do push back against him on that because I think that this text did circulate more. I think that it does reflect on the question of place because Mullah Moses spends a lot of time trying to think through Revelation as an event that takes place across an area. He's drawing the Tariqi Rashidi and about 800 years of people talking about Mughalistan, East Turkestan, Xinjiang as a region. And he wants to bring those boundaries back and emphasize them again. So the way that history is being produced in 19th century Xinjiang, and Ryan's right about this, is mostly through local patronage because the old structures of patronage have fallen apart. It's highly decentralized. There's no one authority who's commissioning works. So what Mullah Musa is doing is he's taking those sorts of more scattered texts, like uh, this one from 1852 is one of them, and trying to put all of those together as kind of a repository of local stories to tell one master story about something bigger, about the difference between being Musulman, which is what Turkic-speaking Muslims call themselves, and being Hui. What is it to be local versus being an outsider? So I think that Mullah Musa was very aware of these and he was reflecting on them uh, and trying to bring them to bear on an older tradition of history writing that was self-consciously Turkic it was self-consciously local, and that did try to bring coherence to what seemed to him to be scattered memories. Hi, yeah. Um, so the text of uh, Mullah Musa, is it, uh, the text is in um, um, what language? It's in Chagatai. Chagatai. Yes, so let me show you a short example of uh, how the text looks and include the slide. So Turkic language, direct ancestor I'd say of Uyghur and Uzbek, right? Really comes into its own in about the 1400s, sort of known as a classical period of Chagatai writing. People like Alisher Navayi was a very skilled writer in Chagatai. And the language is still used in Xinjiang through the 1950s, uh, very late as a kind of literary language and documentary language. Very little Arabic in it. Uh, I would say that there's a certain amount of Arabic vocabulary, but it's very fossilized. So Mullah Musa knows a lot of Arabic words, but he can't really produce Arabic. It's funny, he'll, he'll say, oh, there's this hadith. And I look it up and like, it doesn't sound like hadith. It means like, it's just like a folk saying, like birds of a feather flock together. So he's aware of the Arabic tradition, but he doesn't use it creatively. He mostly quotes Quran and hadith. But there was also Persian in it. Oh, yes. So the structure is somewhat closer to the Persian? Language. Well, it's a, it's a Turkic language, so it's a little different. Um, it doesn't, we don't conjugate the verbs the same way as, you would, as one would in Persian. So again, it's a high admixture of Persian vocabulary, certainly. And Mullah Musa uses this as much as he can to be floral in his introductions, right? And show off his erudition. <laughs> 
but structurally, Mulemus's text is much closer to spoken modern Uyghur in terms of its grammar. And was that his write, his handwriting, or the one that in the text, the one that you were showing? According to Enver Baitur, who's a last, uh, he's a Kyrgyz scholar who did a real study of this, he says that this, the Beijing manuscript, which is only accessible in this scratchy version now, is Mulemus's own handwriting. And so probably is the Pelio uh, version of Tarek Emnia held in Paris. They seem to be fairly close handwriting, but given the quality of the most complete manuscript, it's kind of hard to tell. It's uh, uh, very professional. His handwriting? Yes. I, I think so. Um, so he was a script, or whoever wrote this was a script. I mean, he, he was a uh, calligrapher. Yeah, he's a scribe. And Mullah Musa was, he's actually praised in another source for his good handwriting. This one reason we think it might be his. So but when, when but you then you get this from the 1930s and it's not quite the same quality, so just really not. <laughs> but the one that you showed and you uh, said it's uh, uh, confusing or it's not very well written, it, the two page. Yeah, oh, all I meant is that it's a bad scan. Oh, the bad scan. It's, there are bits missing of the text all over the place and that's one of the reasons I'm doing the edition because there are all these ghosts, letters fade out, yeah. the red text disappears in this scan. And so someone filled in with ballpoint pen. And so there's, it, this is the best text, it's the most complete, but it's also the hardest to read physically. So that's what I mean. It's a lovely text, I love yeah. his language. Yeah. But, and on a final note of that though, so a couple of years ago with ACLS funding, we held a reading workshop and you know, to read the Tariq Amni together. And some experts in the field came and we all kind of agreed that Mullah Musa is a good writer, but he's a good writer in a way that's really unfamiliar for people who work on older Chakatai or West Turkestani texts. And so his language is a bit peculiar, a bit idiosyncratic. So there are difficulties. Oh. But the entire text is available if somebody wants to look at it. Yes, uh, the Pelio manuscript you can download online and the ones held in Lund University in Sweden you can download from online. Thanks. No problem. More questions? Hey, um, I wanted to pick up on Eric's question about the intellectual life of this text and mm -hmm. ask if you could say, um, just to have you elaborate a little bit more on what you were saying your response to Ryan's um, argument might mm -hmm. be with a couple of specific kind of pieces. If he's sort of saying that this isn't important in a way, like uh, the kind of missing elements here are one, do you want to say any more about like the place of Sairami himself? Like you sort of skip past that pretty quickly in that opening slide, like where he's located in the mm. intellectual world, the sociological world, the kind of questions that he's asking, how, who, who, who he, who's around him, who he's talking mm -hmm. to, who he's drawing on, and whether that makes him characteristic or not in particular ways that would then also speak to the second part, mm -hmm. which is the afterlife of the text. And you sort of mm -hmm. have mentioned twice, I think, the distribution of mm -hmm. the text, and you have these multiple cases of it showing up in different places. But to what extent can you talk about how it's being circulated, how it's being read, what's happening to it? Because that sort of speaks to this question of what life it has within the Uyghur intellectual landscapes of the time, right? Mm -hmm. Like where it is, where it's coming from in his case, and where it's going, right? Mm -hmm. So those are the two kind of, kind of questions to build on that. And then one specific question. Um, you spoke us here on the 1860s and 1870s for all sorts of obvious reasons. I'm mm -hmm. wondering, is there anything in here, and also about the deep past, mm -hmm. what about the 1820s? I mean, that's a place that you'd think mm -hmm. many of these questions that are right at the heart of the things mm -hmm. that you're talking about, about legitimacy, about Islamic organization, about rebellions against rule, all coming across the frontiers in the 1820s, early 1820s. Mm -hmm. And like that's right there within living memory, you know, fathers and grandfathers' generations. Mm -hmm. Is that ever kind of taken up as, you know, in some way to set alongside this story mm -hmm. about the Yakubeg era? So I'll start, those are excellent questions. I'll try not to be belabor them too much. I'll start with the second one. So the question's really about sort of the Jahangir incursions and the, the attempts of various rulers from Central Asia to, to retake land in, 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 in East Turkestan. Sairami talks about it, but he doesn't seem to feel a connection with it. Sairami, I think because of the experience of Yaku Beg, is skeptical of outsiders, which is something interesting here. I think that plays back into what you're asking about the place in local history making. Uh, 
is he puts the boundaries of Mughalistan pretty firmly between Kashgar and Khokand. There's an inside and outside. So he talks about Jahangir, but it's actually a surprisingly anodyne passage. He sprinkles it around here, talks about Chinggis Khan around there for some reason. It's sort of, he doesn't quite know what to do with that event. And maybe I have to look back at it more closely, but it seems to me that he doesn't really get engaged in the politics of it as, as much as he does with the other stuff. So that's a weird question that has to be left open. I'll have to think about it more. As for context, this is a great question because, so Sairam is from a little town called Sairam, named after the town of Sairam in what's now Kazakhstan, because his ancestors were forced to move there a century uh, and more beforehand. So he thinks himself partly also as an outsider. So he's an insider in this region, but he traces his ancestry to the outside. And so I think it's one of the reasons he feels licensed to be more skeptical and more critical of what's happening around him. Plus, like a lot of intellectuals in this period, he seems to feel kind of disenfranchised. At one point, he ends up uh, enslaved by the Hojas of Kucha before he's made a tax collector. And so he feels like he's been victimized by power over and over again. He basically spends his entire career moving between uh, Kucha over here and Uchturpan. He was a tax collector on this road uh, in this area. So that's really what he knows best. And he doesn't seem to have left uh, that area very much. On the other hand, so you're asking about uh, the afterlife of the text and its circulation. So we know now, uh, a diary has just been released saying that uh, one of the Russian consulates met him and apparently had a look at his manuscript. We know that this manuscript got passed on to the Russian Pantusov, who had it printed in Kazan in 1903, before Sairami had even completed the revisions to the text of Mithat Arkehemedi. So it traveled fairly widely and I think part of his connection through Tarbagatai and Ili up in the north was because the interest of Russian ethnologists and ethnographers in collecting these texts and sharing them with what they thought of as their native informants, like Korban Ali Khalidi. Um, to speak more to the afterlife of the text, uh, so first of all, on the question of significance, how significant is a text, that's a hard thing to judge, honestly, given the state of the textual record for East Turkestan. There are literally thousands of manuscripts currently held in the Tsongjiao Suo, the, I guess, religion office in Rumchi, that are cataloged but are completely inaccessible to scholars. There are many more in the Xinjiang Library that are locked away. We do not know, on the base of our small sample of manuscripts available outside of China, how significant a given text actually is. If we can't actually look at them or do any sort of quantitative analysis of how many of them there are or where they were from. So I kind of want to reserve a bit of judgment about how significant something is. That said, that Sairami's text was not only copied in various places, but that was copied into the 1950s. And that if you look at the 1930s copy, there's a, the text indicates that someone took an older version and a newer version and tried to unify them. Someone did real textual work on that to put them together. And someone who wasn't in Sairam, but who was down in Yarkand. So I, I don't want to make a concrete statement that you know, this was the most circulated text, but one, there are more manuscripts of it known than of the other chronicles from this period, by far. And two, someone was willing to pay enough attention to the text to correct it, and then Ghulam Muhammad's case to build off of it. I think that's pretty significant, personally. Uh, does that answer your question? There was a lot of parts in there. Is there anything I'm missing? Okay, th thank you, Doug. Hi. May I ask what he has to say, if anything, about the Nakhchbendiya? Not much. He puts them in the context of local history, for the most part. He seems to indicate that the Mahdum Zades were, again, much like Jahangir, Yaku Beg, kind of outsiders who stirred up a lot of trouble. So he identifies himself as a member of the Ahle Ali and claims descent all the way back to uh, Ali, Ali ibn Ta Abi Talib. And so I think he sees himself as being better than all of this. He talked about the fights between the, the Black Mountain and the White Mountain, you know, brought a lot of chaos and eventually the Qing showed up and brought peace to Kashgaria is what he says. So one of the reasons Sairami is interesting then is the way that his whole view of history where the Qing is sort of a, generally speaking, an optimistic and positive force gets reversed in the other historiography. So he hates the Jungars, 
and he thinks that the Naqshbandiya were fools and that they collaborated with the Dalai Lama and other sorts of infidels. But that the Qing, because they allow us... Supposedly. There's a story about Afal Koja going to Lhasa and getting his support. It's a great story. It's a great story. Depends what side you're on. Yes? So uh, did this uh, kind of uh, thinking uh, translate to uh, any uh, uh, architecture, like uh, uh, any sort of shrines or anything? In that oh. So this is actually a really good time for shrine building and shrine renovation. Because Yaqub Beg, in order to establish his legitimacy, see, this is part of the story, is that Yaqub Beg was sent to Kashgar with a Maktum Zada Hoja, who was supposed to take control. But Yaqub Beg instead basically exiles him, sidelines him, and seizes the rulership for himself. In order to become legitimate, Yaqub Beg then engaged in a lot of shrine building and renovations. So uh, Suruk Bukhra Khan, uh, Abu Nasr Samani, uh, Ordan Padishah, uh, the Apak Hoja mausoleum, like all of these received a lot of patronage in this period. Now the question, does this translate into architecture? That's hard to say because I don't think that we know enough about the architecture of the period. That there was a picture of uh, some mosque in the advertisement thing. Was there? <laughs> I, I haven't seen the poster. <laughs> Uh, it, it might have been a very nice picture of the Golden Mosque in Yarkand. It was blue. It was blue with uh, blue tiles, uh, uh, two dome thing with a... It could, that could be the shrine of Sutuk Burhan in Atush. I don't know. I, so I have a... It was, uh, sorry. Your, it was uh, the advertisement with your picture and that. I didn't make the poster, man. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I... I'm going to insert myself and ask oh, a question. Okay. So I, I found it really interesting and exciting the way um, Sairami inserts and interblends Chinese time and Islamic time. Mm. And I know that I understand from your presentation that the sources available for understanding that may be limited. But could you give us an idea of how of that process of, of weaving those two stories together mm. and what were his sources? I mean, he seems to be privy to even court gossip, being able to pinpoint court struggles in, 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 in Beijing. Could you tell us a little bit about his sources and how this process comes about? Well, you didn't have to be privy to court gossip to hear rumors about the Empress Dowager. And I think there are travelers' narratives from Xinjiang this period. Unfortunately, the Chinese language record from Xinjiang this period is a little spotty uh, because people didn't really keep a lot of diaries. But it's pretty clear that all of this information about happenings in Beijing was reaching Xinjiang in this entire period. So it seems like Sairami was talking to Chinese people, probably talking to Xiang army soldiers who had settled and remained there. Um, I, the only textual sources I'm sure of are the Huihui Yuanlai and the Gangjian Yizhulu. But that said, those two texts were also part of a broader constellation of primers and sort of simple introductions uh, that the Xiang army propagated in this period. So there's a Li Kitabi, right? Which was actually bilingual. So you'd have the Chagatai on one side and the Chinese on the other. You can make comparisons if you wanted to. Uh, there are various primers being produced. The San Zijing and things like that were distributed. So there's a lot of textual stuff around that he could have accessed or probably maybe could have had someone sit down and translate to him orally. which seems to have been something that a few translators did. Apart from that, it's not entirely clear what the sources would be exactly. Um, the Shunjur Edict later gets translated, as I've described to you in the 1890s, by a Manchu-speaking translator into a cool Chagatai pamphlet that looks like uh, an account of Revelation, which is kind of neat. That said, I don't know about the circulation of that text. I made thousands of copies of it, and it should have been a nice Chagatai introduction to Confucian moralism, but I've only ever seen it used in the book binding for a copy of the Shahnameh. So we don't know much about its circulation. I would have no doubt that you could have seen that. I know that that and the Li Kitabi were fairly widely distributed. You would have been curious about it. But I haven't found the textual smoking gun that would tell me that there's a past in the Tariki Hamadi that is from one of those Chinese works. Give me a year. Yeah, give me a year. <laughs> More questions? Or, okay, should we?
Was it ever illustrated? No, sadly. This, I, can tell, I can tell what your specialization is. You would probably hate my field because there's so little visual material in East Turkestan from this period. No, I don't hate and it's, no but it's, it's, it's really troublesome because, so uh, Yusuf Haji had started his chronicle over there intending it to be a chronicle of Yaqub Beg that made him out to be a great ruler. And he even ruled out places on the page where there would be illustrations, but no one filled them in because Yaqub Beg died. So <laughs> we have very little visual material from this period, unfortunately. Uh, photographs here and there, sure, but none of this stuff was illustrated, which... Yeah, that first page you showed with the diagonal line. Which one are we looking at? Yeah, oh, that, sorry, that's an earlier text. That's from Central Asia. Sorry. It's just the cover of the book. I, I chose it because it was nice handwriting and it's a reflection on the nature of language. So. Further questions? Did you? Ernie? Ernie? No? Okay. Um, if there are no further questions, I'd like to thank Professor Schlissel for an excellent presentation. And uh, yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for being here.